Okay, so today's lecture um, is on static verification. It is the logical follow-on from the lecture we did on testing with Jest. If you remember, we talked a lot about like what correctness is and software verification. And in particular, that lecture, we talked about dynamic verification as a topic. Um, this one is static verification. If you remember what the difference between static and dynamic is, good job, otherwise we will cover it again. Um, but before we get into this, just a quick preface, this is the first new lecture of 2022. I'm pretty sure every other lecture here is some kind of restructure or revamp of a previous lecture, uh, but this one is totally new. And the reason it's totally new is because I think it is an extremely important topic, having taught this for a long time and worked in industry for a while, um, and I'd love for students to get more in touch with it. For those who are kind of more familiar with the colloquial descriptions of 1531, this is the lecture where we teach you TypeScript. Um, and we don't actually do a lot with it in this course. And I'll, I'll keep talking about this after, but I want to really preface it is that this is introduced as a topic because uh, me and some other academics are certain it's important. We make you kind of use it for the project, but we literally make you use it in like the most minimal way possible. Like you can kind of not know most of it. You can know very little about this topic and get by perfectly fine. And it's by design like that, because when we introduce new topics into a course, it's really good to just kind of let them exist for a while. And we spend a few terms just feeling how students respond to it, which helps us know where like, that's a little bit miserable. That sounds really interesting and that was valuable for them. So point is, you're going to get a little bit confused in this lecture. It's pretty natural. It's taught much earlier than we expect you to worry about it because you don't need to worry about this until week four in the labs and week five in the project. Um, so do your best to follow along. If you understand it about 40% level, it means you're like dead on the money. You're going to be okay. Uh, if it's less than that, you'll figure it out through the labs. And if it's more than that, you got a big brain. So, you know, good job. Static verification. Uh, I was really excited by this idea once when someone explained to me that you could write a piece of software that was compile time provably correct. And what that meant was like, if you could compile software, that you, sorry, that you could compile software that in theory, the compiler or say GCC in the context of C, it would know if you did everything perfectly, right? And that's really exciting because it means your code's bug free. Now, again, I mentioned this last week, it's a bit of an unattainable idea, but the principle still remains that the best time to improve safety safety is before, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, safety safety. Yeah, it's actually a phrase we used to have in SunSwift, funnily enough. Every time someone did something safe, someone would say safety safety quietly to them, so. The best time to improve software safety is before the code runs. So if you can get as much like debugging, as much testing as possible away from Jest, so to speak, and towards like the compiler, which you probably don't have a sense of with JavaScript, but think about it like GCC, then good. That's really good for you. We're going to talk about what type safety is, which is the main way we're going to be looking at static verification. We're going to look at TypeScript as a language and then go through a bunch of examples. Um, I mentioned to you early on, uh, particularly last week, let me find a code example, that if you go and look up all the lecture code, you will see that all of the lecture code sits in these three, uh, three folders, which is M0, M1, and M2. And M0, again, we mentioned is like your week one, two lab and some of the early lectures. Um, M2 is like uh, a couple of lectures next week. Um, and then M3, Sorry, M1 was a couple lectures next week. M2 is like all of our lectures from now on. So it sounds like we kind of chop and change a bit, but like, honestly, um, this is just kind of saying from now until the rest of the course or from your week four lab, we've kind of laid on everything and everything we do from this point will be the same. So we're going to be looking at some slightly different environments. And again, what this means is that you can't run the code we show you today and you're like week three lab. You kind of have to wait for your week four lab. So... Software safety, the main type of safety we're interested in is called type safety, funnily enough. Um, the main area of safety we're interested in is called type safety. And what we mean by types is literally like data types, like variable types. Think back to C, ints, doubles, char stars, all of that. Um, 
And the point of type safety in a programming language is essentially preventing a mismatch between the actual and expected type of variables, constants, and functions. And it's like, what in the world does that mean? Well, think about this. In JavaScript, you can do some really funky stuff, like you can say, um, you know, const a equals 4, and you can say const b equals high, and then you can say if a equals b. And the thing is, this code will run. There's no kind of, like, compile time checks where the code, like, just says, that's dumb. Why did you just ask me to compare a string to a number? Whereas if you were to do this in C, right, and you had down here in C, char star b equals high, and you said if a equals b, you know what you get in that instance is some kind of compile error that says something like, oh, um, you know, cannot... I mean, what error do we get? Let's play around with it, right? We all know how to program in C. So say we've got a program here, we don't even need... Wow, that coloring is not very useful. So say we have like some kind of int main... We have an inst a case here where we just kind of check if, if uh, A and B are equal. You know, and if A and B are equal, we'll just return 0, otherwise we'll just return 1. Pretty simple program. Yeah? I'll just put it out here. There's the program. Now if I go and compile that... ...correctly... There we go. Warning comparison between pointer and integer. Compile time. This program has not run yet because there are some type safety checks that exist within JavaScript that stop us from doing silly things here. And this is great. That wouldn't happen in JavaScript, right? JavaScript, it would just run and give an output and potentially have a bug. So an example of how these type safety checks statically improve our life is right there. Now, if it wasn't already obvious, C is type safe. Um, as types must be declared and the compiler will check that types are correct. You've just seen a demonstration of that. JavaScript on its own is not type safe though. It doesn't just work type safely. It doesn't work safely with types out of the box. This doesn't mean that there are no types in JavaScript. This is kind of like a common, I think, misconception in expression. And I think in programming, knowing how to communicate is really important. You couldn't say that JavaScript has no types. JavaScript does have types. It's just, it's a loosely typed language dynamically typed and it's not type safe. So things are a string or a number or something else, it's just the JavaScript doesn't really care. If you try and compare a number to a string, it's like, yeah, whatever, yeah, let's, let's do it, see what happens. Um, so whilst everything has a type, the type is not actually known until the program is executed. Whereas in C, kind of the, the way the compiler has to run is that every single variable in C needs to know what type it is before it runs. Um, there isn't a lot of kind of what you what you'd call like dynamic polymorphism big words in the in the program. So we like type safety; it's good for us. It makes our um, it makes our code work better. But what do we do about JavaScript not having it? We've just said that it's important, but that it doesn't exist in JavaScript. Um, so, well, in the absence of it, we do what we were doing last week, which is we start testing software dynamically. <coughs> oh God. Um, and we do this by catching issues at runtime. We could do this by writing jest tests, you know, pretty, pretty reasonable. We go and write some jest tests and those jest tests will test our program, make sure it works, but we'd rather check it statically like we do in C. How do we do this? We need a way to check it. And that's where TypeScript comes in. TypeScript is a funny little thing. Um, I think what's hard about explaining what TypeScript is, is that most of you have an impression to date of like, you have a language like C and you have a language like JavaScript and languages are very, very different things. Um, the way to think about TypeScript, I think at the simplest level is that TypeScript is a different language to JavaScript that just looks extremely similar to JavaScript and it feels pretty much identical to JavaScript. So imagine, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's like copying and pasting someone's assignment and changing, changing a few things, you know? Think of it like a bit of a plagiarism of JavaScript, but you added a few extra lines to feel smarter than your friend. Um, so, and it's a language therefore built on top of the JavaScript language and it's really just JavaScript with a few little extra elements to it um, that helps you actually check the types of your program. The funny thing about TypeScript that makes it a bit weird to use is that it it actually, what it's really actually doing is that it's, it's a language that checks the types of your program and if the types are good, 
it actually goes and kind of quietly runs normal JavaScript underneath. And that's why we shouldn't think about it as like a totally separate um, idea because it's really a wrapper around JavaScript. In other programming languages like, you know, Python, we have libraries like MyPy. So the way to think of TypeScript is different to JavaScript, looks the same, and its whole job is to simply be like the bouncer for JavaScript, you know, something in front of it that you can code in and there's just an extra check at the start. Um, you know, and Tony says, are all languages allowing us to declare types type safely? No. Um, some languages don't have inbuilt type checkers. Some languages do. Some languages have weak ones. C is actually a very weak type language in a way. You can't actually do a lot with types. We'll show you this through TypeScript. Like, ty like C is a much more strongly typed language than JavaScript, but TypeScript is probably a much more strongly typed language than C which is, might be a bit of a weird concept, but we'll see that with some examples. And what you see here is here's actually a piece of TypeScript. It's a very simple function. It looks like what we've seen before. We've got a function called sum, you know, which takes in an A and a B, and it sums them, to, it returns them, and then we console log the calling of the sum function. The one thing you'll notice that is different from what you've seen with normal JavaScript is that um, we've actually got these two annotations here, which are colon number and colon number. And it's actually a little bit like C, like this isn't any, this is not a new concept to you, right? Like if, if you wrote a C function like this, you know, you'd, you'd write a C function that's like int sum, int a, int b, return a plus b. You know, like you're pretty, you're pretty familiar with this as an idea. You know, um, so the, the way we're annotating the type is just slightly different here. Instead of saying int a or something, we're saying number. And it's like, what is number? Well, number is like kind of an integer or a, a double. If you think about it, it's just like a different type system. It's just a way of saying, you know, something numeric, something that you could kind of sum. Um, so that element's a bit different, but we're just annotating. But besides that, it's normal JavaScript. It's not a totally different language. It's just JavaScript with this annotation. Um, but the question is, how do we run this? Because we have a problem and I'll show you this if, if I am um, sorry that I don't have the terminal up already. I was fixing, fixing the little lecture thing. Um, if I go into m2 source and then I run this piece of code, 3.3 mycode.ts, right? Which looks like JavaScript. It's just, it's a little different and it's got a .ts for TypeScript instead of .js for JavaScript. If I go and run that, you see that Node, when it tries to interpret that, when it tries to run that code, it says unexpected token colon. That's because Node, the normal JavaScript engine, is just like, what in the world is that? That's not part of the language. And that's why it's a separate language, actually. Like, that's why TypeScript is a separate thing. Um, I'm very confident that they're working towards a solution where these are less, less of two ideas. Um, I guarantee you in five years, you'll be able to run this code with Node because TypeScript's extremely popular, extremely popular. So. Um, and who wouldn't want the ability to optionally add extra type checks to your program, right? It's just kind of like a win-win. It's just like what I said last night, or Monday night, sorry, is that sometimes JavaScript moves so fast that it just takes a while for things to catch up. So rather than like the, commu the main community, the ones that kind of manage Node integrating this, there's these kinds of side projects. There's side projects everywhere, all the time. And most of them die because they're terrible. TypeScript didn't die, TypeScript took off. And everyone's like, wow, this is so useful. So let's, now that it's useful, let's start the multi-year process of integrating it into Node.js, you know? So it actually like runs part of it. So right now you can't run it with Node. A Little bit annoying just for now, but that's, that's why we have to talk about how we run this code because we can't just run it normally. Um, to run TypeScript, we actually need to install dependencies like Jest. You know, think about Jest for a second. It is JavaScript, but it also looked a bit different to JavaScript, didn't it? It, it like really is JavaScript, but like it felt like a bit of a semi pseudo language and we needed to like do a dev dependency install, do an NPM stall of Jest. We need to do a very similar thing with TypeScript where we actually install these TypeScript libraries because funnily enough, even though like TypeScript's a language and we, and we say it's like Node, the weird part is that it's actually just an NPM library. If I go NPM JS and I look this up, it's actually a library and a very popular library at that, right? 34 million downloads a week. Oh my God, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of downloads. Uh, 36,000 dependents, oh my God. 
It's a lot. It's a massive library. And there's another library we're going to download called TS Node. Now, TypeScript is the actual kind of core library that allows us to check types. It allows us to actually, you know, interpret the code as you see it. TS Node is like a really helpful library that basically instead of using TypeScript to convert TypeScript to like original JavaScript and then running that with Node, um, TS Node is like a library that you can download that essentially just allows you to like run TypeScript as if it works with Node, you know, like, because in an ideal world, you could just like write TypeScript and then type in Node myfile.ts, but we can't do that yet. We will in the future. In the meantime, this library needs to exist. I'm sure this library won't exist one day, but it exists for now and it's extremely popular right now. Um, Tony says, is Jest a library as well? Yeah, Jest is just a library. Everything, anytime you npm install something, it's just a really popular library. This probably has, yeah, 18 million downloads a week. The libraries we use in this course are massively popular. Like extremely like core, standard, very, very popular libraries. Um, so, let's keep going. Doesn't work. What do we need to do? Well, we follow the lecture notes. The lecture notes say that we need to run npm install these two libraries. I can put two libraries here and it installs one after the other, right? Actually, I think I need to go inside m2. So I install that. Great. It goes and installs them into my package.json. Now for the lectures, I already have a lot of modules like installed in this folder. So um, there'll be a lot more in the package.json that you'll see, but mostly, uh, mostly it's just Normally, it'd just be these two. I'm just really killing time saying nothing of value until this. It's already installed. That's the worst part. I, oh, I think it is. Maybe it's not. Doesn't matter. So we go and run that. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to actually run TS node, which is like the node equivalent on our code. Now, you remember with Jest, um, Jest wasn't like a a system library, right? It wasn't like Node. Like you can just run things like Git and Node and um, GCC because they are kind of installed on your computer. You know, as like programs. Uh, whereas things like Jest aren't actually installed on your computer; they're installed in your project. And therefore, to run them, we need to kind of, you know, be clear to the computer where they are, because otherwise, the computer just doesn't know they exist. So what I mean by that is, if I just type in TS Node. The computer's like, I have no idea where that is. Because on Linux, how it works is that there's a whole bunch of paths that exist like these, and they're separated by colons here. Um, and basically, it's just looking for programs in these paths to run. And it can't find a program called TS node anywhere. And that's because TS node does not exist in any of those folders. It exists inside this folder, inside node modules, inside dot bin there's a file called TS node. That's the actual program there. That's if anyone's ever wondered that, if you remember in C, cause I don't, I don't think they go into this much in C, but if you remember in C, um, they'd say things like, you know, you compile your program and then you run dot slash like high, like this, right? So, you know, you make your high dot C, it's an int main program that does nothing. You compile it, it outputs a file called a dot out and then you run a dot out and the computer knows to look for that there because you've told it where to look for it. Whereas if I just write a dot out, the reason it says it can't find that is because if you don't specify where it is, it's always looking for it in one of these folders here. Um, but obviously a dot out's not there. It's in this folder. So we need to specify that. And similarly, when we install the TS node library, we need to be very clear of where that is too. We need to actually say dot slash node modules slash TS node and now it'll work. Now it's actually that that's the program. That's the node thing running there. It's just like node, but node, I don't need to specify that because it was installed on the computer. So TS node, and then I run source 3.2. What was it? What was the file called? 3.3 .3 my code dot TS. And now this will actually run. Great, right? It, it prints it out. And if I open up, uh, let, 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 let's open up this. Have a look at all the code. Um, if I go inside the source folder here and I look up my 3.3 .3 my code, um, that's that's all it did there. It ran that. Oops. It just ran that code. 
So like I can run TypeScript like I can run JavaScript. It's a slightly different language that has a slightly different way of running it. It's pretty easy, um, pretty manageable, nice and simple. And you might be thinking, what's the point? Let me just double check here. That Yeah, you might be thinking like, what's the point of TypeScript? Well, the point of TypeScript is that unlike JavaScript, I can actually write code now that will protect itself from silly things like this. This will fail. See here, argument of type string is not assignable to parameter of type number. So our code is actually protecting itself before it even ran. We have improved the static safety. Remember, static means before it runs. We've improved the static safety of our code because if I create the same file that's just called 3.3 mycode.js, right, and I get rid of this thing, and I just run it, right, with node source slash 3.3 mycode.js, it runs and it tries to add them together. But that's weird. That doesn't make sense. What if I like, I don't want Java, like I don't want, if I'm writing a library and I want to create safe software, I don't want to allow someone to put in BS into my function. I mean, 1A is like a number. That's the worst part here. You know, it's not even like, I passed in, let's look at it, uh, you know, how do I, how do I do? Is it type of, type of blah? I think so. If I run that code, it's a string. You know, what happens if I add one and three? I get 13. You know, I don't want that. Now you could say that, all right, Hayden, fair enough, but that just sounds like a stupid programming language, right? Maybe. That's definitely true to some extent, but the principle still remains the same at, at scale, right? This, this could just be a bad example, potentially. It's a simple example, but we want to prevent that. And TypeScript helps us prevent that because we can annotate code and there's a static element of running the code that happens before it runs that says all this code needs to actually make sense. There's another element to um, TypeScript which is really useful. There's kind of two key commands that we deal with in TypeScript. One of them is TS node, and the other one is TSC. And TSC is, um, I, get, I get this wrong every time. I think it's the TypeScript compiler. Um, though it might be TypeScript. Yeah, I think it's TypeScript compiler. I hope so. Um, TSC is the actual thing that does the TypeScripting. Um, TS node is actually just a little wrapper that does the type scripting and then runs it as node. Um, and this is just to give you some kind of background here of like how this works is that, um, oh, I'm, I normally don't run this, but let me try it out. Yeah, I didn't think that would go particularly well. Yeah, but I, I kind of really want to show you this. So let me let me let me actually just like let me show you an example of I'm going to make a random folder called go on a bit of a tangent here just to really drive something home. I'm going to call it like env9 for no reason. And what I'm going to do inside env9 is I'm going to create like my own oop, not get an inch. Shit. I'm going to create like an npm you know thing. So I've got like a new npm and then I'm going to you know npm install save dev. I'm going to install TypeScript and TS node in here cool and then i'm gonna you know like uh create a file called mycode.ts so imagine this is you this is how you'd maybe run typescript by yourself so i've got like a, some code there that's like you know mycode.ts cool and then what you would typically do to run that and we're probably missing some configuration which will really demonstrate to you like how kind of finicky this whole thing can be um Okay, it didn't work. That makes sense because like in our code, we were trying to do something that shouldn't. But like this is all you need to do to run TypeScript, right? Really, really simple. That's TS node though. Another command you can run is TSC. And what TSC usually wants is a folder to run in. So because TSC checks like a whole bunch of files typically, there's usually a bit more setup involved that I'm probably... Let me, let me just try this. Normally we give you all these setups. Okay. If you run TSC, 
what it actually does is it checks all the files in your kind of folder, if you've set it up correctly, and it makes sure that they're all type safe. It doesn't actually run anything because it's a bit like GCC, right? When you, when you write code in C, there's two steps. There's the compiling step where we check it's okay, and then there's the running step. So in reality, what's happening is that there's a program called TSC, the TypeScript compiler, that goes and compiles your TypeScript into something that Node can run, and then we run it with Node in those two steps. And the TS node thing we saw before is just, again, I'm just reiterating the same point. It's just a shortcut method where they get combined into one step. Whereas this is just checking the types. And you can see this, right? I'll show you this, it's quite interesting. If I open up the code in this folder, and what I'm showing you here, you don't have to do much. So don't, don't stress, I'm really giving you some theoretical background. Um, this is it here. When I run TSC, it checks it. So watch what happens if I put an error there. Watch what happens if I put an A there. TSC will fail. It's not trying to run the code. It's simply trying to compile it. Right? Like this. When it, just like normal GCC, if you don't have any errors, it'll just come back and say, all good, no issue. Let's keep going. Um, and to give you like the full understanding of what happens here, how to, and this is again very theoretical, I'm just giving you background, how TypeScript actually works is when you run the TS node command, it runs TSC, which outputs some JavaScript that looks like this. This is what you might call like compiled TypeScript. It just outputs JavaScript and then it runs that JavaScript. So you can imagine what TS nodes like actually kind of doing is it's running that command and then right after it's running mycode.js. So it's like those two steps there. And therefore, if there's like an error here in your code like that, what it actually does is it does that type check first. And if the type check fails, that was the wrong file to edit. If that type check fails, it simply doesn't run your code. It just says there's a problem. And then you fix that up and then your code works fine. So that's all TS node is. But as far as you're concerned, at a high level, all we're really doing is saying to you, instead of running node, you now run TS node. And instead of writing .js files, you write .ts files, which are basically the same. They just have a few slight changes to them. So really quite easy. Um, you can go and like uh, add some shortcuts if you want. So for instance, in this new little project I made here, you can add a script. I can, I can uh, remember how I said that if you add a script like TS node, when these scripts run, it actually adds the node modules path to the, like the runtime environment. So you can actually like, um, you can just do something like this. T they, it seems a bit silly and redundant, but it's just kind of how it works there is that now instead of having to write out that whole command to type check, to like check, I can actually just run like npm run tsc like this. And that'll run the tsc command. And similarly, I can now run npm run ts node on mycode.ts and it will just run it. You know, so we've really reduced this to something that's not that different to what we're already doing. Okay, let's do a slightly more complicated example. I've got this, let's go back to our other, actually I might, I might need to keep copying code across here. Let's go, because it's easier to run in a small environment. So if I have a look at this, I've got this piece of broken code, right? And I'll call this one like broken.ts. And you can see here, fairly straightforward function called many string. We've already seen something like this. It's one of our previous examples. Uh, where all we're really doing is taking a string and multiplying it, kind of like concatenating it to itself many times. But there's a bit of a problem here, um, which is very, very easily picked up on with TypeScript, which is that it expects a number, which is the number of repeats, and then a string of what to repeat. But in this particular case, we've given it to it the wrong way around. And this is a great example of where, uh, you know, TypeScript can be really helpful because if I try and run broken.ts, it actually won't run because it's like, hey, argument of type string is not assignable to number here. And I'm like, oh, I need to swap them around. But again, think about what would happen if I had this in JavaScript. So let's say broken.js. Let's write some JavaScript for it. Remember, JavaScript's really similar. It's basically the same thing, just without the type annotations. So now instead of running that, I run node broken.js. 
Oops, wait, why did that? Yeah, I run node broken.js. See that? This is the problem. This is like the whole problem with soft. Like this is why we talk about software safety because this program didn't crash. And there's a whole hierarchy of bugs which we haven't really gotten to. And it's like you know, there's there's this idea ironically that compile time errors are the best errors because they're so like in your face. And then runtime errors are kind of the worst, like a divide by zero or a tan of ninety because you don't know it's a problem till the program's running. And then the the actual worst kinds of errors are what you call you know like logic errors. Um, undefined behavior, which is where the program seems to not crash. This program didn't crash. It just ran and it gave us a strange output. And this isn't good. This isn't good for us at all. Um, because now it's like it seems to work, but it didn't. It's fundamentally screwed because what actually happened here was we passed in hello to repeat and then we passed in <coughs> five to string. Um, <coughs> and like, what happens if you try and do a loop where i is less than repeat? You know, it's just not going to behave. It's not going to like it very much. I'm not sure why the stream is buffering. I have fairly strong uh, signal right now. So maybe it was just a second, but it seems pretty stable at the moment. So let's hope it stays that way. Um, so yeah, fairly simple code there. And similarly, if we have our broken.ts, we can just run npm run tsc to actually, you know, make sure that it behaves. And it says, oh, you've got that wrong. And you're like, oh, good spot. Thank you, TypeScript. I appreciate that. Runs again. Good. Everything's fine. Love it. Tony says, if we want the user to input an integer, but the program is given a string, will TypeScript catch this error or the program will keep running and give the wrong output? This is a hard question to answer because some things you just don't know what you're going to get at runtime and inputs a bit complicated because inputs always a string so input checking is not really something that typescript helps you with necessarily typescript helps you with everything that you know at compile time which is a surprisingly high amount surprisingly high amount it helps you with you know undefined variables and uh poor types and like misuse of functions like You'd be amazed how many of your bugs come. Think about what we were doing on um, the other day with like date functions, how we were passing dates into the date functions library. We might be passing it in wrong sometimes. I guarantee you there's probably a bug in most of your JavaScript code somewhere you've written in this term, but like no one notices it. It's a, probably a type error. You know, there's probably an instance where you've passed an integer into something where the integer could be null, but you're not dealing with the null case and no one's tested the null case. Like it's actually really common. Um, and it's very interesting. Uh, Jen says, uh, might be a stupid question, but why would we need TypeScript if it's so similar to JavaScript? Is it just to compile code that without it can't be compiled or tested? It's literally just to check types. That's it. And there's a few things it does, which is kind of useful, but it's like, it's predominantly there to annotate your code with types so that when you write big complex pieces of code, and then more importantly, when you use other people's code, like when you use other NPM libraries that... Um, you make sure you're always passing in the right thing that it's expected. Derpy says, does that mean JavaScript could be less secure than other languages as intentional poor inputs could mess up a program? Yes, this, I mean, I don't know if I'd like, secure is a hard one because you can kind of like, security's. I, I want to come back to saying it's less safe. We use this term safety to describe software that could be accidentally misused. Of course, there's probably some more vulnerabilities that exist because you know it's it's less strongly typed but it's the bigger issue is that javascript is definitely less safe than a lot of other strictly typed programming languages as accidental misuse could easily mess up a program and you will not realize that you have accidentally misused it you know until it runs and that's the the problem with runtime remember how in the dynamic verification lecture we pointed out that testing dynamic testing with jest is identifying bugs. It does not remove the presence of bugs, it identifies bugs. So what I'm saying is in the labs you write, there could be bugs in your code that you don't realize, but TypeScript will pick up on because it's very easy to pick up on type matching errors and other things. Okay. 
I think it's a good opportunity to kind of just very quickly pause here and I'll remind you at the end because last term we had a lot of misunderstanding with this but the way we integrate TypeScript into your project is actually really uh, light in the sense that um, what we actually do is that the way we've set up your project for like week five and stuff when this comes into it is that when you run your TypeScript code, we actually tell TypeScript to like ignore most problems, to just like forget about it. But we tell TSC to look at them. Um, and why we do that is because we want you to be able to like work with TypeScript, run it. But if your code doesn't work with TypeScript, if you've got type errors, we don't actually want it to slow you down. So what I mean by that is like, if you have some type errors in your code like this, Right, the way we will set up your project is so that when you run npm run ts node on broken.ts, it will actually run fine. Like it won't actually give this error. We've set it up so that it just runs it normally because it can actually ignore that. Like um, I'll show you. It's like a uh, TypeScript ignore error. I don't know. The what would you say? Ts config ignore type mismatch? I don't know. There's some it won't ignore. There's some pretty obvious ones it won't ignore. And to be honest, maybe that's not a good example because like none of you want it to ignore that, right? None of you want it to ignore that. Uh, that's that's something you should be like, thank you TypeScript. But there are sometimes annoying errors. I'm actually going to come back to this example because I think as we get further into some of the other pieces of code, it'll be more immediately obvious like what I'm talking about. And I'm probably just speaking very abstractly. So let's keep going. Um, how to TypeScript? Uh, okay, we're going to start looking at some examples. Types are added to programs simply by putting, or typically by putting the type name after a colon. We've seen that in the first code example. When we define a function, the parameters typically need to be typed explicitly. That's one of the most common places that you put types in with TypeScript, is in function definitions for the parameters. In this case, we specified that both A and B were numbers. One thing that's interesting about TypeScript, and it's very good at this actually, is a language It's quite powerful. TypeScript does not require you to put types on everything. It will infer types. That means it will guess types where it knows it can guess confidently. And it's, guess is not even the right word because it implies that it could get it wrong. It will derive the types deterministically if it can. Otherwise, if it can't, it'll tell you. So if we say take a simple program like this one, this function hello here, right? I'll create a new file called blah, blah.ts. Right, we got name, string, and stuff. But if I say here const um, first name equals Hayden, what I don't need to do here is to say um, string. I I could do this, right? Because remember that we're saying types are just added after the names of particular names with a colon. I could do this, and it would kind of work, right? If I ran like npm run ts node blah dot ts, it'll run. Uh, it doesn't print anything out, but it'll run fine. But if I don't have this here, it still works fine because you got to think and imagine being in the brain of TypeScript. It's like TypeScript's like, hmm, what type is, is name here, right? So if someone, let's imagine that you're TypeScript and someone gives you this function and they say, yeah, figure out what type name is. Is it a number? Is it a string? Is it one of many other types? It's like, I don't know. How are you going to figure that out? Whereas if someone comes along and says, um, hey, I've got first name, it's equal to the string Hayden, TypeScript's like, well, I know it's going to be a string. So it's, it's got a very powerful type inference system, which means that you don't actually need to derive too much, which is really good. And it's also why you don't need to specify what this, this function here returns. Because you can specify the type the function returns, but you rarely need to because TypeScript will look at that and say, well, or if let's say I'm actually returning something. It'll be like, well, he's returning name, and name is a string. So I think he's returning a string. Or if it's like, well, he's returning name plus A plus B. Well, if I add a string to a string to a string, I get a string. So I must be returning a string. So it'll figure a lot out for you, which is very, very handy. Um, let's look at some actual examples of what you can do with TypeScript. Let me just click ahead a couple of slides to make sure I know how much we got to go. Because um, this will run 
We might take a break in the middle. This, this takes up a little more than half of the lecture. So lots of examples to go through with TypeScript. And I'm actually just going to go and copy a lot of them from the env2 folder. Cool. Um, where are they? Why can't I see them? That's rude. Let me try and fix this up. Okay. All right. Let me close this and reopen it and see if it appears. By the way, I was talking about like pathing on the computer. This is why whenever I open up this editor I use, I actually have to like tell it where it is. Because if I just write the name of the program, it doesn't work. You know? So I've got all this code here and let's talk through some of them. So one of the first ones is just like a standard function definition. Probably the easiest one because we've seen it already. In this case, this is how you this is how you specify a return type for a function. You put like a colon string at the end or something else. For instance, if I wrote colon number here and I tried to run this particular piece of code, you'll see that what will happen is it'll basically be like, no, that doesn't work. Right? And it's like, okay, well, maybe I have to return a number or something like that. Now, obviously, you wouldn't do that, but it, it will actually do that check. So those functions are relatively straightforward. Um, unions are a really interesting concept. Sometimes you might have a function called like, you know, print if ready. Um, and what you want is you want that function to be able to take in a variable called ready, but you want that to be a number or a Boolean. Maybe, for instance, you're adding TypeScript to some code that didn't have it previously. And you know that there's lots of instances in the code where people have been passing in true or false, right? Where true is like true. Or they've been passing in zero or numbers where like in a, in a Unix style return code, um, zero means success and one means fail or something like that. Now, maybe that's a dumb idea. Maybe one non-zero should be true. It doesn't matter. It would depend on what you're doing. But let's say for a second that zero or true means true and false or non-zero means false. Well, with TypeScript, you can actually represent that type by saying that it is either a Boolean or a number. The pipe meaning or. You know, it's like a normal if or, but, you know, it's just one line, not two. So in this case, I'm like, cool, okay, well, ready is either uh, a Boolean or a number. And then my next line of code here checks, well, if ready is true or ready is zero, this should be a, oh, it is, yeah. Sorry, if ready is true, already is uh, not zero, then console log ready. And then I've got these five things here that should give me what I expect. Ready, 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 right? Because most of these are... Oh, sorry, I said that wrong before. I said if it was zero, it's true, but it's actually if it's non-zero. Um, now this is weird because it's printing out four readies, but I would have thought it only prints out Three. Maybe I didn't notice this. There was a problem with this code last time. Okay, so false. Why did false? Why did false say it's true? Oh, because it's not zero. Oh, well, that's very. So if ready's true or ready's not zero, but the problem is that. How would I fix this? I'm really. This is not a difficult problem to solve, is it? My brain wants to be like, well, you know, I could just be like, well, if it's true, truthy, and that, I think that does solve it, but maybe there's a more elegant way of doing that. I don't know. I'll leave that alone for now. Let me just make a note of that, that code example as well. Um, what, what is 3.3 unions? Yeah, so it's like, this is really handy because it means that you can represent this. And it might be like, well, um, you might be thinking, oh, well, what's even the point of this? I'm already doing all these checks. Like, why do I need TypeScript? Again, why don't I just make like a, a JavaScript file? Oops. Yeah, why don't I just make a JavaScript file that isn't TypeScript where I don't need to type annotate it? You know, because this should run fine, shouldn't it? Node 3.3 example unions.js. That runs fine. Yeah, but the problem is that like, what it allows you to do is it allows you to start doing things like this and pass in empty strings and like arrays and like, you just don't know sometimes like it, 
it adds a level of comfort because obviously now this all succeeded, right? This is the problem. You didn't think people were going to pass in strings, did you? And it's like, okay, sure, you could filter out strings. You could add more checks here. Like I could say, you know, if type of ready is equal to a string, then, you know, like return. There's a lot of things you could do, but the whole point again, think back to the very beginning of this lecture, is we said that the main objective is to, where possible, move your safety checks from dynamic to static. You want to move it away from Jest and move it towards TypeScript in an ideal world. You know? Because, well, A, um, well, it's just more convenient, frankly. It's the massive part of it. Dynamic tests are kind of painful to run, like you figure them out later. You don't you don't really want your code as much as possible to be dealing with edge cases during the running. Also, like, what do you do in this case? Now you have to define the behavior if someone calls it incorrectly. Are you going to throw an exception, which we'll talk about later? Are you going to return null? Are you going to crash the... You know what I mean? It just It's like it's more inconvenient to do it that way. So, so instead of doing that, we prefer to do what we do with TypeScript, where now if someone comes along and adds that, the running of TypeScript will be like, oh no, there's a problem. There's a problem. There's a few problems. All of these arguments are not assignable to the expected type. So that's unions. Unions are really helpful when there's like, you actually need to take in potentially two different types for something or multiple types. Um, there's also lists because sometimes our types aren't always booleans, numbers or strings. Quite often our types are going to be lists or like arrays of things. So if we have a look at, um, when I say lists, it just means arrays. Lists and arrays are kind of used interchangeably here, which is I have a function that takes in an item and it creates 10 of them and it returns that. So for instance, if I run, you know, console log, um, create 10, create 10 list of A, you know, let's see what this program does. npm run ts node 3.3 example lists dot ts runs. Yeah, it gives me an array of 10 items. But what if I want this to work for like strings and numbers? Well, I already did the union thing which we did before, which was really helpful. And maybe I could add more if I wanted to, like we could do booleans as well. So now TypeScript will accept a few different things. Oop. Oh yeah, that wasn't, obviously that wasn't gonna work, but we'll fix that up after. But the thing is, and this is, this is one of the examples in TypeScript where you do actually need to define something is that, if you have code like this where you have an empty array, right? Um, this might seem mostly okay. And I actually think it'll let you do this. It does let you do it. Uh, but if you have strict TypeScript on, which most, most kind of organizations you deal with will, uh, the problem is that when TypeScript tries to derive what's in this array, I'm pretty sure that, I'll, I'll show you. There's actually a flag that we can add to TypeScript, um, which we actually have on for your like TSC checks, but like you normally in the project, this would succeed. Like what you have here would succeed. In fact, I'm pretty sure that we've set up your project so that you can pr pretty much for iteration two, uh, we've set it up so that you can pretty much just run normal JavaScript with TypeScript and TypeScript will just be like, I'm going to ignore everything um, so that it doesn't get in your way. But you'll see like, what was I trying to show you here? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not. There's a, there's a bunch of, this is all, this is all like how TypeScript's configured that you don't need to worry about, but there's a whole bunch of like, I'm probably turning on the wrong check, but there's a check here that like, makes sure that you declare something correctly. The point is that um, TypeScript here will look at this empty array and it'll be like, hmm, that, that sometimes might be really hard for it to figure out what type that ARR AR, AR variable should be. So you can actually be more explicit and say, hey, this is actually an array of numbers. So you take a type and you wrap it in another type, which in this case is like array. But sometimes you need to take that further and say, well, obviously, since the item that's the item that's in the array is a string or a number, um, the array itself is an array of strings or numbers like that. You know, super simple, uh, and that works fine, and that's that's really helpful, and that's how you deal with arrays in TypeScript. 
Now, aliases are another interesting topic. Um, by the way, this is actually really basic, but all this TypeScript stuff we're doing is like, this is like so far beyond most of what most of you will do in the course. This is kind of a little bit of fun, to be honest. Um, so, you know, it's a lot, but it's not really that much, but there's a lot of few things. Most, most of you probably won't interact with half of this, but that's okay, bit of fun. Um, now let's say I've got a function called create 10 list uh, and I want to pass in an item. Sometimes it gets annoying to like do what we did here where we're always like string on number, string on number, string on number. So we can actually alias the types, a bit like a type def in um, C. If you still learn type def, some of you might have, some of you might not have. I do think they've removed them. Um, where you can just literally say type list item is equal to string on number and then use that. It's just like a variable, you know? You, you know how to program. It's just saying this smaller thing is equal to that bigger thing so I can repeat myself more concisely. You will notice that there's actually two syntaxes in TypeScript for making arrays. One of them is array with the brackets um, and the other one is uh, what we saw before. You can, either do a, you can either do arrays like that, which is kind of C-ish style, or you can do arrays kind of more Java style like that. Both of those work. Both of those are um, typical. Bill says type defs in comp 2521. That's right. It is in 2521. It used to be in 1511, but I do believe they've trimmed it out. Um, but yeah, that's that's how you can do aliases. So aliases are fun like that. Uh, optionals are actually really important. It's probably one of the few things that you'll find super useful. Um, we'll take a break soon. I've got this function here called substring. And a substring function is a fairly, fairly standard function within programming where it takes in a string and it takes in a, an index in that string to start and an index in that string to end. So it's like, it's essentially a way of going, well, if I've got this like array of all these different characters, like a string, you know, say the word cactus or something, um, a substring will take in the string like this, and then it'll also take in like, say this start point, this end point, give me these three letters. So that's what that function is doing here. Taking in a string, the start point and the end point. It creates a new string for that smaller string. And then what we say is that the modified end of that string, this gets a little bit interesting, is either, it's either like, the end index it's given, like in this case, see, see here how I like call it with Hayden and I pass in zero and three. So what that means is go from index zero H, right? Zero index, zero, one, two, three, four, five, like that. So I say go from zero and finish at zero, one, two, three. So go like H A Y, right? Like that, um, or go three character, you know, to the third index. Um, but if I don't give that if I don't give that argument right, if I have a function that doesn't need that third argument when I call it, then I'm instead if that argument was not passed in, I'm just going to use the string length. I'm basically going to say go to the end of the string. So it's like a bit of a backup case so that people don't always have to enter that end index. Then I'm going to have a for loop here where I say, well, let i be equal to start, which is the start index. Go until you reach the end index, whatever that is. And then for each character, go and append that to the string. So this is like a, a neat little function. I'm pretty sure that JavaScript has this built in. This is more just to convey a point. Um, but the reason optionals are really important in JavaScript is that, in TypeScript, sorry, is that without this question mark here, TypeScript will sometimes get mad naturally because it'll look at this third function here and it'll second function call and it'll be like, hey, this function expected three arguments. You only gave us two. This is another good example of where TypeScript's really helpful because it actually like stops you, um, you know, it, it stops you using a function incorrectly. So in this case, you used it correctly. Now, a couple things we can do here. One is we could say it's either number or undefined. We could use the union case, which should work, but it doesn't. I always think that works, but it doesn't. Ah, it's annoying. I think I always assume that works. I think this only works if you actually pass it undefined. Anyway, that doesn't work. I think I screwed that up last term. I was like, this works, doesn't. Um, but you, if you actually give it a uh, question mark there, it's like the TypeScript shorthand of saying, this variable is 
the type of this is number or maybe it's nothing. So the question mark means maybe it doesn't even exist. And that's what allows the code to run. That one's actually super useful for optional arguments. Um, so you'd probably find that one you know, pretty useful a lot of the time. How much we got more? Just a few more examples. Um, <coughs> objects. You know objects in JavaScript. Uh, they look like this here. For the top part here is TypeScript. Um, you have something like this. You say const person is equal to, you know, an object with uh, the name key. And that key has the value Hayden. And um, then you say person.age equals 5, right? Now, once again, if I was to create a JavaScript example of this code, and you got rid of the TypeScript elements of it, and I just ran it, 3.3 example objects, like that, um, obviously it works fine, and if I was to console log person, we would get a, a, an object with two items in it, right? Uh, but in this case, TypeScript will typically expect that I tell it what a person is, right? If I run, if I run TypeScript version of this without any TypeScript, it'll usually be like, hey, um, oh, oops, TS node, it'll be like, hey, um, I don't know what that is, or more importantly, what it's actually doing here is it's trying to infer the type, because it can, right? It's like, oh, I think this is obviously an object with a key called name that is a string, because he said that literally. But the problem is that then my other code won't work, because when I then try and add this to it, TypeScript's like, oh, I'm sorry, I kind of, I decided already what this was, and now you're trying to change it, you know? Like, I've, I've had to, I'm trying to make the program type safe, I'm sorry, I can't add you, I'm going to have to throw an error. Uh, but what we do instead is we actually explicitly define what person is. And we make a type called person. It doesn't need to be the capital version of it. It could literally be called uh, llama, right? It could be called llama. And we say that, well, this is TypeScript. We say that llama is an object and it has a few different properties. It has a property called name, which is a string. It has a property called age, which is a number, but age might not exist. It has a property called height, which is a number, but height might not exist. So now this code actually works for us. And you'll see if I didn't have this optional here with the age, it would not work. It would fail because it's like, hey, you just defined person as a type llama, but you said llama has at least name and age, the keys that are strings. Maybe not height, but I don't see a height, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Cool. Uh, literals are kind of fun. This is actually pretty useful for the project. Um, it's one thing that you probably aren't familiar with from a language like C, but if you ever have an instance where like, you have a function that takes in um, a, like a string, but that string's always one of a very few set of, of values, you can actually use what's called a, a type literal which is where you, and this is actually true for your project. This is what you do in iteration two. No matter how many times I throw my fingers up, someone's going to ask on the forum, do we have to use TypeScript for iteration one? And the answer is no, 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 iteration two. Okay. You can answer them on the forum now when they ask. Um, is if I, instead of saying visibility is a string, I know that it's only ever going to be two strings. So instead of just saying it's a string, I can be like, well, it's actually... Inst instead of being like visibility is a string, I can be like, well, it's actually literally either public or private, the string. And you can do the same if you want to, right? Like you could create a sum function that takes in two numbers. But let's say you only want that function to work on numbers that are less than 10. You could create a, a type called sum number like this, an alias, right? But then you could also just go and instead of that, you could actually give it a literal. You could literally just be like this. You'd be like, yeah, it's literally only going to be these eight numbers. And then this is really powerful because now when you call the sum function, it will literally only let you call it with those exact numbers. Um, now, obviously, I haven't had a use for the second case here. This is a bit of just a dumb example. The top case is pretty useful, but it will fail. It'll be like argument of type 11 is not assignable to a parameter of type sum number. So this is, what, this is what I mean by a powerful type system. I said at the start that um, C is not a powerful type system. Uh, 
you know, I mean, it, it's not like bad. It's more just like there's a lot. It's a ri this is a rich type system, and many other type systems are like it as well. Uh, and then the last thing is the any type. Very interesting type. Any type is what you do when you're lazy, when you don't know what a type should be. When you have a program like this and you think, God, I don't know what that should be, so you just put any there. And any is like a pass-through type. Any is like, um, it's like a way of saying, like, literally just do whatever. Whatever, man. No safety checks. Just let be be. You know? Um, yeah. That's it. There's some examples here. We could take previous functions we've worked on. Um, hello, substring. We could use any if we want to. Um, yeah, it's the this is fine meme, right? Like, it's the it's the this thing. That's that's any in a heartbeat. Um, it's actually really useful when you don't know what a type is because it kind of unblocks you. Um, normal TypeScript will actually throw in, like normally what would happen is that you would get an error if you use any. Um, so I'm just running TSC now, which will actually check all the, the files in the folder. And it says there's a bunch of errors it's found. Um, oh, I think it's because it's created all these. Yeah, give me a sec. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, thank God we're at the end of that. I do this like once a week. I need to slow down. Oh, I hate Unix. <sighs> Don't accidentally hit the space bar between your star and what you're trying to do. It's meant to be remove everything that has something .js, but I instead ran this command as remove everything and then a file called .js, but no file called .js exists and then it removed everything. So, okay. Well, there's the examples gone. We're just in time for the end of the list of examples. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. This was just a quick run through of TypeScript really quickly. And I wrote all these examples and I thought about very carefully how I want you to interpret them and build on them. But the actual like full list of things you can do with TypeScript are written. It's on the TypeScript Lang website. It's, it's really the documentation is really, really solid. So you can go and find that there. A quick summary of type safety. Um, languages with non-optional built-in static type checking are like C, Haskell, Java. Languages with optional but still built-in type safety checking are like TypeScript and Objective-C. What that means is that TypeScript has is a typed language, but you can say ignore it. You can't do that with C. C won't just ignore stuff. C's like, can't ignore it, have to do it. Um, and then there are languages with like optional external type checkers like Python and Ruby. Um, where you can install them. You could argue that Python's the same as TypeScript in a way, but that's right. Don't, 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 don't lose too much sleep over that. Um, there's a slide here about migrating to TypeScript. Uh, you don't have to read this. I kind of put this here nearly for my own therapeutic benefit, um, which is to say that when we go and... So ignore this slide. When we go and convert your iteration one to iteration two to get you set up for TypeScript and all this other stuff, we go and we did, we will do these things to move it from like where you're at to like where it's going next. And I'm just put this slide here so that you can kind of, for the really nerdy types, um, you can understand what we do. And you can see it includes like installing a few extra libraries and adding some files and updating some things. Again, you don't need to worry about any of this. It's more just saying, I don't, I don't like waving my hands more than I have to. So this is what we'll end up doing when we move like certain things you do to TypeScript. Um, the cool thing about TypeScript is that you can add it to the, um, the pipeline into the GitLab CI file that we talked about last week. Last week? Yeah. Uh, which is awesome. I think it was last week. It was last week. Surely. Yeah. Yeah? <gasps> it was Monday. Oh, no. Okay. Last lecture. <laughs> 
feels like a while ago. Um, you know, we can actually add it so that when you push your code to, to GitLab, it's really cool now because you can actually have it run Jest and then also run TypeScript or probably in the other order makes more sense. But this is really helpful because if you, you know, this is for, again, lab four and iteration two onwards as we're layering on ideas to you in this course. So that's super useful. We'll obviously add this to your pipeline sometimes. If not, we'll tell you how to add We'll tell you how to add it. And then lastly, don't stress. Um, we do so much of this for you. We've set this course up so that uh, we don't actually like... I talked a lot about this with some tutors. This is a very new concept. And I, and I have to say, like this term, I feel like last term it felt like we made some mistakes. This time I'm feeling really good about this in terms of how we've been able to structure it within the project and teach it for students. So I think it's good. I'm feeling good. Um, I think I need one more term before I start making it worth marks in terms of saying to groups, if you don't do this, you will lose marks. Um, or not lose marks. Like to get, to, get, to get the last, these marks, you need to make sure it all tight checks. Uh, the plan this term I think is that... Um, we introduced TypeScript as a tool, not for marks necessarily, but a tool to help you to kind of get marks implicitly because if you use TypeScript properly, it'll actually reduce your bugs, which will improve how well your code performs. Um, but what we've been talking about is that for your, the, at the, towards the end of the project, there's actually this component of bonus marks, which is normally actually really hard to get. Like you normally have to do a lot, a lot of work for it, but what we've been, um, what has been agreed is that we will say that if you make sure that when you submit your kind of final iteration, if all of your code is completely type safe, you know, it passes TSC, we'll just give you all the bonus marks. You get an extra 10% of iteration three. More information will come about that later, so don't stress, don't ask too many, too many questions. But the point, because I'll tell you when we do iteration two, but the point is that that's kind of how we've structured it. So it, it doesn't, and the exam has a bit of TypeScript in it too, right? But like, so, you know, you'll write TypeScript, but I won't like test you too hard or anything like that. Um, but that, this is our plan. Because if, if we don't give you marks for it, you won't do it, right? I respect that. But I don't want to like put a whole bunch of marks. Um, I don't want to put a whole bunch of marks in and then add it to like, you're like, oh my God, there's so much. I have to figure out this and figure out that. It's just too stressful, right? You've got a lot of things to figure out. So the plan is to basically just say, well, there's bonus marks. You can do something cool or you can just make your code type safe, which is probably easier, which means that anyone who wants the marks, you'll probably all just do it, which is great because then you do it. And if you don't do it, you don't lose any marks because they're bonus marks. But if you do do it, you've learned something, you know, everyone wins. So that's where we ended up with that. If you leave some feedback, that'd be great. We're going to take a quick eight minute break. Um, eight minute break and then we'll get into the next part of the lecture which is linting which is another fun topic which really gets us towards some of the end of a lot of these environmental things so um thanks chat soon <laughs>